Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Michelle Munson, and I get the uh, honor of kicking off this uh, wonderful virtual ETC conference. Um, my new company is called Alluvio, and I have the pleasure today of telling you about our content fabric, uh, which is now in production, and we're going to do our official launch of it publicly at IBC this year. Um, the title of my talk is Building the Content Internet, and uh, you'll see in a moment how this pertains to uh, our ambition with the, with the fabric. I want to give you a little bit of introduction to the situation that kind of drove this and, and our interest in, in, uh, in creating this um, new approach to video distribution over the internet. Obviously, we sit in 2019 with much of the internet behind us, um, almost uh, well over 45 years since the first IP messages have transmitted. And arguably today, the, the internet is no longer a network of data. It is a network of video, given the amount of traffic that is video and also the rate at which the consumption patterns are growing. Along with that, uh, user attention really outranks data as the driver for the economics. And there is no greater job for user attention than premium content. So with those three things in mind, if we kind of take a step back and look at our present situation, um, even though we live in the era of video over the internet, the internet as we see it today was not natively built for video. Uh, at the core of this, our distribution technologies are really the same approach and workflow that we've been using, even with all the cloud innovation, file-based workflows, the same approach we've been using for about 20 years. And those stem from what have been the web uh, web-based caching techniques that started essentially scalable web document sharing over the, uh, over the internet 20 years ago. Secondly, I think everybody uh, feels that there are aspects of the user attention economy that are, that are not working well for all parties. Um, at the top is, is the obvious point of the viewer experience uh, in terms of uh, what digital advertising and the sharing of viewer data uh, is like right now. Along with that, it's extremely challenging for content providers to be able to be profitable and competitive unless they control internet distribution. And along with that, the supply chain complexity continues to grow, which uh, uh, kind of compounds the, the economic challenges. The positive side, and, and what's really, I think, created this, this opening for a new approach is the fact that computing has advanced in many ways. And uh, because of those, there is an opportunity to take a more content-centric approach to how we think of the intelligence of the internet for video. So with that in mind, today's content distribution is essentially based on edge web caching. It's about 20 years old, and uh, I wanna spend a little time showing you what that looks like. So today's CDN is largely at the backbone of video distribution to the consumer, and also in some cases to business audiences. And that hierarchy uh, was built out to essentially create a dense network of edge caches for web object serving. And the workflow that we put through that today is now dominated by video and video file versions. So if we take a step back and look at that, a typical program for digital distribution is made up of many file versions. And uh, I just did a, a sort of back of the envelope estimate. If you were to have a program that goes to the classic uh, you know, 10 plus viewer platforms on mobile, desktop, and TV that consumers have, and you multiply that by the major language versions that often get made, and then you multiply that by the um, consequent major DRM solutions that are associated with the devices, and then finally you multiply that by a classic adaptive bitrate ladder that encodes each of those program versions into different bit rates, you end up with a few thousand versions in file form of the same program, right? And we can take that back down a level in the internet and really formalize this statement in terms of how internet routing works. Um, and this gentleman, Van Jacobson, uh, needs no introduction. He's one of the fathers of, of TCP IP networking. He made the point, uh, starting about 10 years ago, um, that we have a situation in the internet that's unsustainable. Right now, the way we route packets is opaque to what they are. And if we count the duplication, particularly for video streams, uh, through the network core to users ISPs, it, 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 it is many times over. So what we've essentially done is create for ourselves a video uh, distribution supply chain that relies on creating all of these versions. Um, 
repackaging them into many different file forms and pushing those through the network to try to get them to edge caches to have the most uh, low latency experience for the viewers. The downside of this is that red glut that you see at the top, which is a huge amount of load on core internet bandwidth and also cost that comes uh, as a result of that. Uh, that gets passed on to, uh, to those using these services. And then the other piece that comes along with it is, is slowness for interactivity. And nowhere do we see this more than the current raging debate about how to try to extend this architecture for low latency live. Um, one of the most tricky factors and sort of impossible uh, uh, reality points is that the manifest file that guides adaptive bitrate streaming in a live scenario is constantly updated, so it cannot be edge cached, which means every, every client's uh, request is going back to some upstream point. Um, and then along with that, of course, the rest of what happens in live just further gluts this, the, this situation. So the technical argument here is we need a different approach. And now if we turn ourselves to the user attention economy, the, the sort of economy around this, we've got a bunch of things challenging us. And if we kind of cut through the chase, for the viewer, digital advertising is not great in a lot of ways. Um, user experience about clickbait, we can all debate about that, but uh, has many downsides. And then right now we, of course, have a, a widespread national and even international, uh, let's say, social policy debate about what to do with the fact that people's data is essentially uh, gathered in the process of, of gaining their attention to, to uh, content online. Below this is probably the most important point for content providers, which is that internet distribution control is really necessary to be profitable. And we have seen, not only in the papers, but around us in many people's jobs, mass consolidation of classic uh, content providing companies to try to create an economy of scale in the direct to consumer situation that exists right now. And then along with that, we have a lot of smaller content providers that have interest in content that in some cases can't afford to get it to their audience. Finally, supply chain. So most major media companies have initiated at this point some kind of supply chain reexamination or transformation effort. The problem with the current situation, we would argue, is that it is really entrenched based on this expected technology and the way things currently work. Uh, right now, we've got a lot of different solutions that are expected to work together, and all of them have to be bought as individual uh, services in order to get from that source media out to the consumer. And again, arguably, with a more streamlined technology solution, the cost and complexity could be simplified a lot. So um, why do we have a chance to fix this now? Uh, computing changed. It changed radically in the last five years. And I want to stress these points because never before have all of these things been true so that we could make solutions like what I'm going to show you. First is machine learning is mature. This gives us tools and algorithmic techniques to solve larger scale content routing problems in new ways. We can do native audio video processing and transport in software intelligence in the network. And you'll see that we've built some novel technology to do that. Blockchain ledger data protocols are very scalable and they allow us to do better than distributed databases have done for really scaling what we think of as the state and versioning um, around media. Crypto has changed. We no longer need to think of protecting an isolated box of media. Instead, it is possible to have media be self-protecting in trustless security models with new cryptography. Compute costs are going down faster than um, ever before, and that includes the availability of new forms of specialized compute, obviously FPGAs and TPUs, in addition to the, the, the just sort of mass proliferation of and mainstreamization of GPUs. And then edge bandwidth, particularly with 5G, is ever more available. So the available bandwidth keeps going up and up at the edge. Right? So if we start to think about what these things let us do, we do have a situation where we could think about the workflow and the implementation from the source media to that consumer a bit differently. And I, we call this content centric. I'm gonna just use a diagram because that gives us a more visual way to think about this. So 
Um, at Alluvio, we have essentially applied these principles to create from the ground up um, a new software overlay network that works differently to get source media and a rendered output to a consumer or to an API program. And what I mean by that is, first of all, this has a logical set of layers that work together to do something very different. That is that when a consumer requests to stream, API program requests output, that request drives a series of activities that happen in real time. And then those can scale without duplicating bytes, I need to stress this, over the network and in the storage. And that fact it's sort of like the IMFization of the network, right? People know what IMF is, right? Um, now, a lot of stuff has to work right for this to be true, but if it is true, it's super powerful, right? And that's the work that we've done to make this work at scale. So the idea is that uh, media is represented in a structural form by reference, much like you would think of IMF as a, as a packaging format in the fabric. So in the fabric's logic. So files come in, streams come in, just like they always do, any type. Those, um, that representation gets created and the underlying parts are effectively uh, sharded around the network. Now those parts are not only the media and the metadata, they're also code. And nowadays it is possible to create code with objects that can then be loaded on demand with the right software approaches. And then finally, there's a contract layer. That contract layer is also software. It happens to be a smart contract in a blockchain ledger that is built in to the functioning of this software overlay network. And why is that such a good abstraction? Those contracts basically define a blockchain compliant mechanism to give an interface of transactionality onto every piece of content. So the first and most obvious thing is that's your interface to change that version. Anytime you update that version or access that version, that a fact goes through that contract interface. And because of that, you also can mediate any kind of authorization or other custom logic that you want around getting access or um, uh, providing custom activity on the content. So if we think about now our end user streaming, person makes a request to stream, just like they always do. I wanna watch that. And what happens is that stream is rendered in real time by reading those parts from storage, wherever they might be in the fabric, and that's optimized by design, right? Loading those up on demand, transforming those, and obviously this has to be done in a particular way, or couldn't work in real time for high bit rate content, and applying that contract code for the access control around this and serving that out to the person as if they were simply streaming from a node right in front of them, right? So that's the model. And these three layers, the data layer, the code layer, and the contract layer, and then the distributed or decentralized functionality of this in the fabric is what makes this work, okay? So this is a 30-minute talk today, so I cannot teach you every detail about each of these, but, or Eric would pull me off the stage, but I am going to give you the highlights of each of these three layers, and then I'm going to show you a demo of this running because uh, seeing is believing, right? Uh, so the data layer, right? This is the more academic uh, part of thinking of the representation of media. And so every piece of media, when you look at it in the fabric, actually has an object representation. That object re representation is structural, and it points at some hash parts on disk. And those hash parts on disk are copy on write. You might want to go look that up on Wikipedia. It's a formal term in computer science that means exactly how this works, right? Which means that the, the only time that we create new bytes is when the bytes are actually different. So if we're making a new version of the object or we're making a copy of an object, the only new bytes that are committed um, are those that are distinct, right? Second thing that happens is there is various machinations that allow us to shard parts, distribute them in the network, and route efficiently. One piece is being able to partition the content parts so they stay in one place even as we scale the network. There's a particular approach that we invented to do that. Second is to be able to find those parts, look them up over nodes um, instantly in network terms. Right? And if you uh, do this in the right way, you can guarantee that you can find most parts 
in what's negligible time in all parts in a network round trip time. And then finally, this code layer is where most of the work happens. And I want to really dig in on this because the most important thing that needs to happen with media is to transform and deliver it through this pipeline that, and also create the transcoded outputs. And I'm going to show you a little bit about this. First of all, at a high level, content gets ingested into a node. The parts are created and they shard through the network. User makes a request and the node that they make the request to assembles exactly what that client's asking for in real time from what is already made and cached or from getting constituent parts from other nodes. And the way that we've done this minimizes the number of hops to go get a part to effectively at most one in, in the large number of cases. And then also, the building of this package in real time happens in a fully pipeline manner. And let me get into some, some concrete uh, data around this. So what do we have to do in order to create a real time pipelining of those parts over the network, transcoding and serving? So this all happens in real time. This, most of this innovation um, really relies upon something we call AV pipe. That is a new software stack that allows us to find those parts, fetch them over the network, and transcode them in a pipeline fashion in the software that's in the fabric. And we built this stack from the ground up to do just that, so there isn't latency between any one of these phases. You can also see that the approach that this uses is pipelined, so that each next segment that the, the uh, client is going to watch is being transcoded in real time in parallel, right, as we're serving the segment out to the player that it has loaded next. And if we look at what this looks like in terms of real time playback, take for example 4K content at 30 megabits with two second segments. The blue color encodes the arrival time of those segments to the player. And you can see across the board, the large majority of those segments are arriving in well under 800 milliseconds, more like 400 milliseconds, right? And in very few cases are we coming even very close to that two second playback deadline. Now, this also extends to live content, and I'll talk to that in a minute because that, that is our, our latest extension of this in the same kind of architecture. On the left, what you see is the choice of nodes. Now, players need to go somewhere, and the players themselves are guided to the right edge node network based on machine learning. And that allows us to ensure that wherever they are in the world, they get the right choice of egress nodes. And also that any selected upstream paths are also optimal. Contract layer. Spend a little time on this. So we talked about this, the pipeline that allows this to happen in real time and be fast. The contract layer works on top of that. And the contract layer is happening um, on each of those access operations. So this is literally a blockchain contract that is part of each content object when it's created. And the main interface to this is to regulate access requests and updates to the content. It also becomes a hook for custom operations that do things like extra authorization or rights controls, recording authorizations, et cetera. Lastly, the cryptographic model that's in this also um, uh, is coupled together with how the contracts work. And this is important because it means that, A, we can prove the versions, the version changes. Um, there's actually a version proof that's calculated directly in the fabric. And then finally, um, user data that is shared is protected in the user's, uh, the user's wallet. So there is no gathering of that user data. And all transactions that happen uh, for a user requesting content are non-reputable and recorded into a blockchain ledger. All right. And you can see a little bit about the versioning and proofs. So each of these content objects has a Merkle tree proof that's calculated and recorded into a transaction in the ledger for each of those updates to the, to the object. And tampered uh, content is literally provable by virtue of reading the content fabric APIs. All right, so this is a lot of technology I realized to throw at you. I want to now show um, what you can do with this and what our customers are doing with this. So 
the first and most important thing that I want to get at is fast, low latency, and high quality distribution combined with supply chain simplification. And for this, I'd like to jump ahead and I'm going to show you one of our customer cases. Very good. So um, one of our first uh, public customers is uh, MGM Studios. And uh, they have been working with us for about nine months and uh, on first on early experiments. And then they said, well, we would like to try this uh, in SVOD services and see what we can do with it. And some of their problems are problems that are similar to other companies in the industry. Uh, they have a really rich library um, and they would like to monetize that. Uh, but it's currently fragmented over several different um, uh, properties. And then also the assets that sit behind those are also in a range of places. And then each of the stacks that serves those assets and those SVOD properties has a number of services involved. Aggregators, CDNs, content management solutions, all of which add up separate costs. Quality is uneven across the board in terms of the streaming quality. Uh, and 4K support is variable across this, and uh, the linear uh, channel cases have uh, at times caught challenges with latency and synchronization. Uh, security is a constant challenge, and like uh, many studios, they have had various incidents of, of leaks. And then finally, they, their creativity in uh, what they can do um, in new experiences that are hybrid or interactive are limited by the technology. So the goal in uh, their first deployments with us was to try out the fabric as a single platform that would allow for first and foremost serving the uh, end user without the support of a CDN or an aggregator or a, a cloud service. Um, and to be able to prove that out in, a, in VOD services that have global audiences and to test out the claims of broadcast quality and low latency video experiences. Um, those properties support a range of platforms, web, mobile, and uh, TV Anywhere devices. So all of those needed to be supported. And I might mention that this was all to happen. The first property that went live had to uh, go live within about two and a half months of starting this. So all of the variants needed to be supportable from source um, as per our claims. Um, and then finally, the goal was to be able to reuse the source master content because it would be in the fabric and ingest and diversioned and be able to reuse that in a broader supply chain project, which we are engaged with them now. Um, they are also interested because of their appetite for advanced technology to look at new content experiences and new monetization models. And, and those get into to many new areas, uh, which I'll touch on. So um, here is the running solution on the content fabric, which as you can see is very light and also eliminated at least three different services that they previously uh, were using. Um, the, uh, let me just kind of walk you through it. So first and foremost, the audience for uh, the SVOD services of interest is largely in English speaking territories. And we have a few nodes running the Fabric software in various parts of, of the world. One of the points of this network is to have very low core bandwidth use um, because that's where one of the costs in traditional uh, uh, networks comes from. So we can maintain a very sparse network. Um, and then a second thing to notice is that there is an existing, in the SVOD properties, there's an existing client experience that needs to be fully preserved, meaning that the clients need to be able to stream fast. There are existing authorization systems and CMSs that the fabric needs to support, including with the blockchain auth, without changing any of that. Um, and then finally, uh, if you look across the network, even though all the work is being done just in time, the client should perceive no difference. In fact, the client should have superior video quality. Right? So how does this work? Well, firstly, the master assets for the SVOD libraries are ingested into the fabric and we create mezzanines in that process. And those mezzanines are literally the, the source content objects. Um, and notice there's an option for that to be done in a private space, which is just a logical space in the fabric in terms of the uh, encryption and the content ownership, right? Uh, and that is the model that we followed in these um, deployments so far. Uh, the content then, uh, those content objects and their constituent parts shard through the nodes 
uh, in the fabric. And then at the time the user makes a request, their, the actual adaptive bit rate um, manifest and also the segments are built in real time and served to those clients. And you can see as the SVOD services go live that for the very first client accessing the content, the, the, the mezzanine part is fetched and brought to that edge node and the ABR transcoding is done and the resulting segments are cached, right? So that first time operation is doing work on the node and is serving in real time and also those segments are cached. So it's responsive in both cases and it's a minimal amount of work. Furthermore, the only bandwidth, and this is the most amazing thing to me as a network person, the bandwidth statistics on the core network are in kilobits. Kilobits, literally. Why? Because uh, after that first fetch of that mezzanine, it's reused over and over and over again to generate the, these downstream versions. And why is this possible? Because of this constituent form of the content object. That also includes the metadata and the contract code that is used to essentially create the offering that's being served out. And this also includes re-encryption with DRM, so standard HLS, AES, as well as Widevine DRM uh, with Dash. And um, these SVOD services serve both Dash and HLS um, today. That was part of, of, of getting to production deployment. Um, and I'll just show you, this is, makes for a good time to to actually do a, a demo here. So, so here is one trailer from the MGM library serving directly off the fabric. And I want to call your attention to, uh, to you can see down here these very high consistent buffer levels. And these are, this is the uh, arrival time for the first bytes and completion of a two second segment. Here's the deadline, here's where it's coming in. Right? And of course, that's what allows for having high bitrate video, being able to have super responsive start times, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? All right, and one more thing I wanna to get to here is to spend a little time talking about this for live, and I will then wrap up there and allow for Q&A or um, next steps, if you will. So this is a pretty detailed diagram, but imagine that um, for a moment that you're a client out here and your interest is not just in on-demand, but in a live stream source. So we have built into exactly the same pipeline a live implementation that allows for all of this to take place, that is the live stream to be ingested and the constituent parts to be created and served through that network, including a live edge that is in real time. And in this case, we have taken that just-in-time concept to its sort of logical limit in that um, all of this pipeline is set up, right? So it is set up via the, if you will, the logic in the fabric around that content. And then at the time of stream, right, the data for that stream, stream propagates in real time through that network. So the only latency is the propagation latency. And this is quite profound because it exploits all the features of the fabric to make a native global low latency experience in reaching, uh, reaching those clients with the live stream. And, and actually uh, just had my first uh, live demonstration the, the, this morning with the broadcaster. So this is a, a very exciting piece. And what does that mean? Um, it allows us to solve these challenges with real-time experiences. Have very low latency, under two second live solutions at high quality, 4K. Um, allow for combining VOD with live sources. Allow for doing recording, right? Where you're using the fact that objects are by reference to create copies with very um, high scalability in the fabric without duplication of storage and also to create new hybrid experiences that can combine together live sources uh, with uh, live content as well. And, and then finally, if I can you know, just kind of point to where this heads, there are many monetization and programming opportunities that come out of this. And I'm not gonna go through these all today, but you can start to think about how the marketplace around this can form for subscription-based services, dedicated ad uh, sponsorship cases, open market ad combinations with content, 
interactive sponsorship cases and customized linear channels that combine together pro, um, live and linear program content as well as um, combine with dynamic ad content. And the viewer in all of this, right, their data stays under their control in their blockchain wallet and any operations for that shared is actually secured directly through the uh, transaction that they make with any other uh, entity such as a sponsor and can be directly under their control. And this is interesting to think about extending the efficiencies of this fabric to new monetization and better um, uh, hygiene for, for viewer data and provability of that going forward. So I'd like to invite you, if you want to learn more about this, to come see Alluvio um, launching at IBC this year. Uh, we're going to have a series of open houses for content providers showing um, the use cases around the fabric and how you can take advantage of it. That will be on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at 3 p.m. in our uh, balcony suites. Um, and hopefully, you'll get a deep dive through that on uh, how you could take advantage of this. Um, we're very excited to bring this to market as we think it can have a lot of positive benefit on efficiencies and new monetization opportunities. Thank you very much.